Okay. You're doing ah, you have to go. Okay, so I'll do it. So um, here we go. Uh, so we're happy to have uh, Freddie give the second talk. Uh, Interest theory for value. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me to speak for a second time and thank you for coming for a second time. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm picking up more or less uh, where we stopped a week ago, um, but it's a natural closing point. So um, we've sort of, we've basically done talking about the Gower's norms and we're now only talking about 1% polynomials. So just to, to recap, so I, I, I'm thinking of some function uh, on a finite group, finite abelian group H. Um, uh, and, you know, any abelian group A, um, and it has the property that it's a 1% polynomial. So that means if I uh, consider all of the possible derivatives uh, of f of degree s uh, plus one, such that um, if I differentiate f s plus one times. Um, so yeah, ideally I'd like f always to be zero when I differentiate it s plus one times, um, but instead I'm just going to ask that it's often zero. So delta times whatever the <coughs> maximum possible number is. And uh, just to reiterate again, uh, so I'm, I'm interchanging freely this notation. Uh, this is just exactly the same as saying differentiate with respect to h1 and h2. So it's, it's the s plus first discrete derivative of f, but it's slightly shorter to write this than to write that. So I'll, uh, I'll write it the way on the left. Um, yeah, so this is a 1% polynomial, and uh, the, the mission is to classify these things. Um, that's by such f. Um, well, at least in certain cases. So, I mean, the cases we needed to prove the inverse theorem for the Gauss norms are where h is something like z mod n z. To the some fixed small power like three or something, uh, and uh, and also well we needed it when a was also a, a cyclic group. Um, I mean, technically it was the the dual group of the cyclic group, but that's just the cyclic group. So uh, um, yeah, so if we can classify f under these circumstances, then we can. Uh, we saw last time that this this implies the inverse theorem. The Gauss norm. So this is our remaining task. Uh, and the specific cases we need, if we want to do the U3 norm, then we need this uh, when we have degree one. So this is asking for 1% linear functions or 1% affine linear functions. Um, and for the U4 norm, we need this when this is two, which is 1% quadratic functions. And, and then so on in the obvious one. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is the last I think I'll say about the Gauss norms. If we can do our mission, then we've we've succeeded in proving the inverse of the Gauss norms. Okay. Um, so uh, quick remark, uh, just a very slight extension of this definition. Uh, so here I'm talking about a function that's defined on the whole of H, and lots of its derivatives uh, vanish. If I have a function that's just defined on a subset of H. I can still say that lots of its derivatives vanish, where, but whenever I write down this derivative, I mean is defined and is equal to zero. So um, this will make sense when all of the points x, x plus h1, x plus h2, and so on are actually in the set where f is defined. And if not, I just don't count it in the set. Um, so let me say if uh, x is a subset of h, and f is the function on a, uh, say, uh, f is um, yeah one percent polynomial parameter delta. Um, if uh, yeah, the set of x and h uh, s plus plus derivatives such that derivative is defined. And uh, uh, it's large. Um, so, i.e., uh, x is h1. Uh, 
only points where function is defined. Um, and if this is true, then necessarily x is large, because uh, if I have a very small set, then I can't have many derivatives living inside it. So I don't need to say that x is large. Explicitly, that's, that's implied. Yes, it implies that x is at least delta h or something. So uh, yeah, that's, that's working in the background. So this is a, a very minor extension of the, the problem. I mean, if you had this function, you could always extend it arbitrarily to a functional of h, and it would still be a one percent polynomial, but that's a sort of unpleasant thing to do, uh, as we'll see later. Um, yeah, question. So I wasn't here last week. What exactly implies the inverse here? Oh, yeah. So I haven't stated the structure theorem yet. So uh, if you hear last time, there's, it's controversial that sort of stating what these results actually say is somehow more annoying than proving, or at least explaining how the proofs go. Um, so I mean, I'll, I'll give some examples right now of, of what these functions actually are. And then the, the structure theorem will be these examples are kind of everything. And then there's so, annoying algebra to do to port that back to an inverse theorem of the Alice norms, but that's sort of annoying rather than, uh, yeah, so I will say, I promise, uh, what the, the structure theorem actually says, but basically any structure theorem as a black box gives you a corresponding structure theorem for the Alice norms. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Well, cool. Um, yeah, so do this now. So, um, it, it is useful to see a few more examples of 1% polynomials just to inform the structure theorem when I write it down, which will be soon. Um, so an example we saw last time was this sort of take a, a linear function um, and there's an add a bracket on the outside, uh, and that extends to high degree as well. So uh, an example would be something like, let's take a function from the cyclic group to the reals, um, where I say, Take some, some polynomial um, defined on z mod nz. So maybe it's going to be something like, uh, let's just do a quadratic for the moment. Um, uh, so this is where a2 is all of the a's are elements of the group, they're elements of z mod nz. So I define a polynomial over z mod nz. I should put this divided by n at the end. So I define a polynomial of the z mod nz in the, in the natural sense. Um, I then think of this as an element of uh, r mod z by define, dividing by n. And then this fractional part map uh, is the function from r mod z to the half open interval zero one that just takes a number modulo one and lifts it to the representative between zero and one. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so by taking a polynomial mod n or mapping to r mod z and then just adding a bracket on the outside, I get a function to the real numbers. Um, so this is not a this is not actually a, a polynomial in the sense that the derivatives are all zero, um, but if you if you do very small amount of computation, uh, then this function would have the property that the third derivatives, well, they're not zero because this bracket keeps getting in the way. So I want to be able to just, you know, subtract off and cancel everything. But I pick up a certain number of small integer errors as I go because of the failure of this bracket function to be actually linear. It's only linear up to small integers. So the third derivatives of f will be, I don't know, some small numbers. Integers between minus 10 and 10, for example. Um, and uh, so that doesn't actually imply that it's a 1% polynomial because you want to know not only that it takes at most 21 values, but also that the number value zero is not weirdly overlooked. Um, but yeah, it, it is in fact true that this takes the value zero at least as often as you'd expect. So uh, um, And you said that uh, there's the, there's also also an inverse statement, right? So if you if your um, derivative takes values finitely many values, then it's a bracket of a polynomial. It's a outside bracket of a polynomial. That's uh, what you said last time, right? Yes. So if it takes small integer values, yeah. then the exact same proof I gave last time just works in in the higher in the quadratic model. So 
saying that this is so so this, the theorem would state that if it takes only small number of values then it's of this form like with a polynomial roughly yeah if you take a bounded number of real values that might not be nice integers so you know you you the derivative is either pi or e or some sort of then uh it's somewhat more complicated but not much but so still true still true yeah so i mean it's a very friendly type way to deal with it. So basically what you can do is, is think of that as being small integers dot some arbitrary vector, because any bounded number can be written as like a bounded linear combination of some, some fixed factors, and then you sort of lift to z to the k or something, and then you run the same argument. It's, it's, it's more complicated, but it's, it's still true. Okay. It's, it's orders of magnitude easier than the, the general statement. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, great. Um, thank you. So that was that example, and I drew this picture before, and I'll draw it again. The, the way I like to think about this is that you, what you've done is taken a real polynomial, an honest polynomial uh, to R mod Z in the sense of all the derivatives of zero. And then you have this, um, yeah, you have the map from the reals uh, to R mod Z by taking the number modulo one. And what we've done is chosen a sort of bounded lift of it. So this picture comes up a lot that you start with the real polynomial and then just sort of jump up uh, arbitrarily to a, a function to the reals. Okay. Um, that's one example. Um, I think as I also said briefly last time. Yep. Sorry. Yep. And this inner of the polynomial, you differentiate it. Um, we look at this bracket thing, then that would do the, the interval, the number of integers you pick up, that depends on um, the, it's like some function of the derivative, the order of derivative. Uh, you, you mean these numbers? Yeah, don't, they don't depend on f itself, or do they? Um, if you is that like uniform? And, um... So if your derivatives take values in a set like this, number, the number of no, the other way around. The other way around. If, they probably depend on the coefficients a zero, so, a one, and a two. Uh, no, no, they are not n. So not yeah, no, no, they, they don't. No, if I have a genuine bracket here. The, the number n is something, so the number 10 is something I just made up because I couldn't be bothered to okay, calculate it. But it 10 depends on two. Right? Uh, it depends on the degree, yeah, yeah. So this is, it's, it's probably it's something important. like. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, I, just, I don't care the value, but it, that's what I was just Oh, thinking. yeah, absolutely. So the number 10 here is an absolute constant, and uh, in high degree, it would be a different absolute constant. It probably grows incredibly benignly, but I, I haven't thought about it. Um, probably slowly. Sorry? Oh, rather slowly. Yeah, very so. I mean, whether it's S or two to the S, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure, but it's, it's one or the other probably. Yeah. And what happens if there are multiple brackets? Um, you still get the same thing? Oh, yeah, I'm about to, that's my next example. Okay, so yeah, let me uh, write that down. Uh, any other questions first, though? Great. Um, yeah, so um, so this is what you have. This is a, a, a what's called a bracket polynomial with exactly one bracket. Um, but in degree two and higher, you can do other things. So for example, I could take um, function f on p with nz, where I take, let's say, one linear term uh, and then another linear term, and then take brackets with them and multiply them together. Um, and uh, that's another, another object. So this is, this is more general than this, because I'm taking two brackets and then multiply, rather than taking multiplying and then taking one bracket. Um, or I mean, if you really want to go crazy, you could uh, you could do more brackets again. So you could take these two linear terms and take brackets and multiply them together, and then multiply it by some large constant, and then take another bracket. And if I remember rightly, this doesn't get you anything more general than just adding up a bunch of these, but it's it, it looks different for sure. It's not obvious to see that. That you don't get any more. So anything like this will work in the sense I'm, I'm about to say. Um, so to very briefly say what this is, a 1% quadratic function, I think it's not entirely obvious. Um, so the point is if you start taking derivatives of f, let's just take one derivative because that's less chalk. Um, so this is something like ax over n. Yeah, so um, minus uh, ax plus h and times b of x plus h. Uh, something like that. Um, and then 
if a bracket weren't here, I would just multiply this out, right? And then I can start cancelling off the A times B here would be the A times B here or something. Um, but uh, because again, this isn't linear, I can't do that, but it's sort of linear up to small integers. So I can just say this is, well, leave the first term alone. Uh, and then for the second term, I can say that this is the same thing as uh, AX over N bracket plus BX over N, uh, sorry, HX over N, by which I mean AH over N, uh, plus some small integer, which I'll denote like this for the moment, uh, times the other thing. So I can just sort of pretend it's linear and then take the consequences. Um, and then if I were to multiply this all out, then I would actually get that this and these terms start to cancel and stuff. So I've sort of made some progress. I've got rid of some terms. And then feel free to go away with a very large piece of paper and take two further derivatives and see what you get. Um, and when you do that, the answer will be something like, well, um, you obviously get some, some bounded integer coming out of all of the, the outermost brackets, but you also, um, a term like small bounded integer times bx over n also survives. That's, that's a real error term that doesn't go away. So I'm also going to get things like this. And so ax over n um, and um, I also get things like a h1 over n. I mean, there's sort of actually quite a bit of choice about what you choose to write here, because you can always then exploit linearity in these things and take a further hit. But um, basically, you'll get a bunch of further linear corrections in the parameters x, h1, x2, h3, and, and you can't get rid of them. Um, so. Stop a dot. Um, so, it's definitely not true that this takes boundedly many values because small linear term times bracket linear could take very many values. But the reason that this is still a 1% polynomial is because if we're lucky, every single O1 of Z on the board will be zero um, because they're bounded integers. So presumably they take the value zero with reasonable probability. And in that case, the right-hand side will just be zero. So all the zero, which is good probability. Then, oh, um, so this is a genuinely new class of examples, and say if you want to go away and put this one as well when you can. Uh, it's, can I ask a question? Yes. So, <clears throat> despite all these little dirty things which stay when you take derivatives, it's for us quadratic, 1% quadratic. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so this is an issue that you would understand and I don't. I would call this thing a quadratic just because. Yes, but uh, don't take my word too, too seriously because uh, in case of Z polynomials with brackets, it's not that clear uh, what is the right definition of degree. Do, do you mean Z polynomials in, with domain? Of course, I would be on Z. Yeah. And then uh, we take polynomial alpha n bracket times beta n mm -hmm. minus alpha beta outside bracket. Yeah. It's a non trivial creature. Its leading term is zero because it was a b growth, mm -hmm. and we are getting into so it's different topic which I believe very interestingly can be connected because this is finitistic version of some infinite life, but uh, arguably uh, the pro appropriate approach to degree would be to take uh, some parameters related to need manifolds from which you can read it. Right, this right. one is like a. E to the power of this thing is a U2. This has large U2 norm. Uh, the one that Vitaly just, just said? E to no, the, this one. The, the sky? I think, I think this is a genuinely U3 creature. Um, I, think, I, th I think maybe not. As far as, you know, I have to re re remember some stuff. It's like, if you, have the if you lost the bracket in between the... But, oh, uh, uh, it's quadratic. Mm -hmm. It's quad <laughs> yeah, it's quadratic in this Sorry. sense, but e if you measure the u three two norm of uh, uh, right. the function e to the power of this. So, 
I remember now, yeah. So if I take e, to the e of e of this thing, e of this thing, then this is somehow degenerate. But if I take yeah. like no, no, you know, I'm just saying it's, it's fine. I understand this. So yeah. If I do that, then I think it's not degenerate anymore. Um, or like, yeah. Um, so if I if I multiply by some arbitrarily huge um, number, okay, I have to think about then, it. Then then I think it scrambles everything, and and you have to uh, then you genuinely need to use three. Uh, not uh, to, to cope with it. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I forgot to take that. Yeah, just one small question before yeah. we continue. So, we don't see any good way of producing the, the inevitable. Um, I'll give an alternative characterization. Well, there's the null characterization, which I'll give. No, that's what I'm asking. I, I know <laughs> infinite. No, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to connect infinitary knowledge with finite reason. Because infinitary but knowledge that's means. You do. What? No, no, infinite like, knowledge. It can be extracted from you. Paper with such as. No, so we'll talk more. We'll okay, yeah. see. I think the next definition might make you happy. This is one more example. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> or at least this one more, one more definition. Um, uh, okay, so just to finish this thing, um, it, it's suddenly true that some something that I write down like this that, that transparently has degree at most two might sort of secretly have degree less than two. Um, so an easy example of that is is you can write down bracket linear functions. Which also take like at most 100 distinct values, right? I mean, if you take, uh, I won't try and write down an example off the top of my head, but, but yeah, sort of um, maybe I will. So uh, if I take bracket ax over n times 2 minus 2ax uh, over n, I mean, this, this looks linear, but it actually only takes like two values or something. Um, so this will be secretly degree 0, even though it looks degree 1. So that can certainly happen. So you can get these sort of generative examples, which you can't completely say a, a lower degree, but they, they behave like lower degree. Um, the only thing I would be worried about is if you said this had degree three or something, because it has to be, that, so that's, that's fine. There you can make it harder by multiplying by B, X over N and putting B inside or outside. And right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can make this number of intermediate size and then it's, yeah, this is all just, this is a real problem and, and it will come up. But, uh, but yeah, so I only assert that these things have degree most two, right? They sort of honestly behave like degree two things. Um, okay, so, so uh, yeah, so in higher degree than two, you can just keep playing this game, just keep multiplying by things, keep taking brackets, and get this whole family of examples. Um, for reasons that are ultimately a question of taste, that's not the structure I'm going to write down. Um, so there's an alternative characterization of these bracket type objects, which is is the following. So if you look at this picture, which is conveniently still here, um, where I map to a uh, sort of a circle, compact Abelian group, and then I sort of lift it, uh, the compact group to a line, and then I, I lift the function to a cover. Um, if you're willing to work not with sort of compact Abelian Lie group, like the circle, but a, a homogeneous space of a Norbiton Lie group, um, then you get the following picture. So I can imagine taking uh, so G here is a, a Norbiton Lie group, uh, and gamma is a discrete uh, and back subgroup. Um, so this is a, a homo compact homogeneous space. Um, I can take a function, uh, let's call it F, um, that I obtain by it's called tor. Um, can I obtain by modulo gamma? Like if I take the bottom function, that's genuinely polynomial, whatever that means. I haven't defined what it means to be a polynomial taking values in general gamma, but there is a definition. It's to do with you know taking derivatives here and seeing what happens over here. Um, and then tor is a, a lift of it. So I'm just going to take some sort of bounded window in the, the group living upstairs and arbitrarily lift this map to a, a map to sort of, uh, so again, if I sort of think of this as some, some compact thing living downstairs, and here I have all of the space living upstairs, but I sort of choose some big bounded window that projects down, then I'm just going to choose values by lifting arbitrarily. This gives me a function taking values in G. Um, okay, but I can then I have a space. I can then compose that with a function uh, from G to the reals, which is itself also polynomial. 
So um, I haven't really explained what any of anything is going on here. I'm, I'm encouraging you to sort of ignore it. Um, so uh, the, the gist is that so this is what I'm calling a, a nil polynomial. Uh, I can define it properly. So uh, a nil polynomial. What's this definition? Or, uh, so a nil polynomial. Let's say f from uh, let's keep it simple and let's say it's taking its real value polynomial. Um, so it's a function where uh, we have some choice of, of this null manifold thing, g mod gamma. So that means G is a uh, Lee group and gamma is a discrete co convex subgroup. Um, I have this function tor from H to G, which is takes bounded values, by which I mean O of one. So the image of every point is sort of in some bounded box, it's like close to the identity in G. Um, and uh, Tor mod gamma is a function from H to G mod gamma, and this is polynomial, whatever that means. Um, and I also have a function, let's call it capital F, from G to RS. And again, I won't tell you what RS means, uh, which is polynomial, um, such that F is equal to F composed. So, um, this is the gory definition of a, a null polynomial. And I think this is sort of all I want to say about it, apart from that. Can't you, like in the, in the two step, like two step case, can you describe it in a very in a explicit manner? That... Um, yeah, so if your null manifold is. Well, okay, that I understand. Uh, well, so it's just a Heisenberg or something. Sure. Um, and uh, yes. I mean, so, okay, the, the grand theorem, which I think in this what setting no one has ever written theory? down. Um, Polynomial. You didn't want to. Do, what is the polynomial in the in the case when um, when uh, H is uh, when G mod gamma is Heisenberg, say the, this thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. Um. Well, it would look something like, you know, uh, you have linear things here and here, and then um, you can have. Anything quadratic um, <coughs> uh, we can write it without the ends. Um, so yeah, you have any map of this form. And then the only tough thing is figuring out when this is n periodic and gamma. Um, so an alternative way of saying it is that I'm going to define what a a polynomial map on from the integers that GMO gamma is, and it's just something that looks like this. Um, and then so you have a polynomial map, <coughs> a regular polynomial map to G, and then you try to understand when it's when when it when it can be defined in G mod gamma to be periodic on N. That is an equivalent definition which I personally don't like. My so preferred what is, what is your definition? Oh my definition is it's just something that maps cubes to cubes. Um, okay. So yeah, so a polynomial map is, is sorry, yes, I should have said that, that it's essentially something that it's a function from Z mod n to G mod gamma that takes a cube here to a cube here. Um, but it is equivalent to saying it's a, it's a polynomial map from Z to G such that when you reduce it mod gamma, it becomes n periodic. Okay. Um, but there's a so theorem that is. Fine, but yeah. your definition is, but that, that's a simple definition, right? Taking cubes. Sorry, yeah, I, I wasn't going to define the Hosskraut cubes in this talk, but. Uh, but for the Heisenberg case, it's not so difficult. Uh, and it doesn't matter. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, sorry, one more question. Uh, let me finish it then. <laughs> and the 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 G to R. What is R S in this case? Um, R S is the reals um, with the F step filtration. So it's considered as a okay. no no filtered Nilbertson Lie group, which happens to be abelian. But the filtration I put on it behaves like a degree S filtration. Um, and it is so sort of yeah. So the, the composite is then a polynomial with degree S. Um, but it, on the function from G to RS is might have to be linear in some terms. Um, so, for example, on the on the center of 
the Heisenberg would have to be a linear function rather than a quadratic function. So, so um, both this uh, tau and this f are polynomial in the sense of the cube sense? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Although it's equivalent in, you, know, you can define it however you want. So, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So two, two small things. First, this capital H there, I just don't see what it's H or H. Uh, this H, oh, sorry, all this, oh, this is an H. This is this is just my fixed finite group. Right, so that's, your H is the same as zero or zero. Yes, thank you. This I guess, but what I don't see, and that's very curious to me, you know, is there a difference between nil polynomial, the way you define it, and just the concoction of uh, bracketed expressions? No, uh, well. <laughs> Well, the only it, it has never been written down in the literature, but I firmly believe that it's true and that I could write a proof if you put a gun to my head that a bracket polynomial and a nil polynomial are literally the same class of objects. Except for the mod n thing. So it's a smaller class, oh, right? That's exactly that's the only thing. It's, oh, it's a smaller class yeah, yeah. because you require them to be so in other words, periodic. There so infinite life of brackets. If things are the same, and then it is finite finitistic thing. This is like a smaller class. Right. Um, so, oh, so, okay, possibly I should refine that. So, what I should say is these correspond to bracket polynomials, which, like the examples we wrote down, are sort of transparently n periodic. So, so in this case, yeah, if I choose A to be an integer, like it, it's clear that these functions are n periodic. They don't like happen to be n periodic if you work out the values. They're like n periodic structurally by design. And I think if you take any concoction of uh, brackets where sort of the innermost things are clearly n periodic, that will give you a nil polynomial and, and vice versa. So, so yeah, these correspond. You go from one to the other, you use your structure theorem and then just impose the periodicity to get on both sides to get like better. What I wanted to understand last time. So. Okay. okay. Um, good shot. Yeah, that's that's the. You can see why I haven't tried to write this theorem down explicitly because uh, what do you? Yeah, <laughs> I don't even want to have to define what that that last parenthetical statement means, right? That it's but it's at least morally these are the same objects. So it's not going to be the same as just saying that it's n periodic. Only what is clearly n periodic different from n periodic. Um. So. Yeah, so it's not going to be n periodic bracket polynomials are not do not come from this thing. No, it, it'll, it'll work out. So if you have a bracket polynomial that happens to be n periodic for some complicated reason, yeah, you can always just make it n periodic by adding extra brackets, right? So you can just say, uh, I mean, the, the function, so the function from no z1 and z, anything special, like clearly, right? For your, uh, clearly, thing, right? It's just, uh, or is there? I'm just. No. I guess no, I mean it. Um, okay, I guess I'm just advertising the fact that if you give me a bracket polynomial which happens to be unperiodic but has some strange structure, the very first thing I'm going to do to it is compose it with this map, which is itself a bracket, right? And this is sort of x times two um, n times brackets x over n. I can compose it with this, and now it's obviously unperiodic. But, but that's going to be the very first thing I do. So no, I suppose maybe I don't need the caveat, and maybe I could prove this theorem. But anyway, yeah, it, it would. It's kind of messy. I don't. Uh, yeah. Seems very easy. Uh, to prove? If you know, if it's very easy to prove, that's great. I, and, uh, <laughs> no, using Vitali's theorem, not. Um, oh, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I think. I think. Yes, maybe, maybe it is already in the literature in that part. I got confused at some point as the definition of degree and, and whether adding more brackets increases the degree. So I, I, I have not succeeded in extracting it from that theorem, but that's maybe because I misunderstood something. So, so yeah, I think this is at least morally known to the human race. Um, uh, OK, any other questions? Um, but yes, yeah, in Vitalis theorem, we don't use the same definition of a polynomial method, right? You don't say it takes cubes to cubes. Does it still? But that would be this. Well, I think that's, still, that's not difficult to show. This yeah, yeah, this thing. Yeah, okay. yeah it's, it's it's equivalent. Um, okay. and it, it's that really is just a sort of definitional wall that goes on. Um, so which of these definitions you find most appealing? Um, it's a rant, but like for me, that was in the 
Z mod n doesn't depend on a particular choice of suggestion from the integers, right? So having a definition that depends on the fact that you map one to one rather than to any other number co prime to n is not the right definition. But, but it's so mine is intrinsic, but it's hard to work with. Anyway, sorry. Um, okay, any, any other questions? Or how are we doing? So, um, okay, so these are the main examples of um, one percent polynomials. That I want to talk about. Um, they're not quite the only examples, and to briefly explain why I can't just say every one percent polynomial is a null polynomial, there are some silly things you can do. So these are these, these examples are sort of dumb. Um, so one thing I could say is that uh, I'm going to define uh, a function on my group H by saying, uh, well, let's say f of x is given by some other function g of x, if x is in some subset x, um, which is quite large, and you know, complete random garbage. Uh, um, right, so I'm um, here, g, let's say, maybe this is just a, actually a polynomial. So yeah, take an honest polynomial and then on sort of 99% of the set, just replace its values with complete garbage. Um, then this is still a 1% polynomial. So uh, the derivatives uh, of f will be zero if all of the points x and x plus h and one and all the way up to x plus h one plus h two plus dot dot, dot fall by in, in the set of good values x. If all of these values lie in x, then I'm just looking at a derivative of g, and that's always zero. Um, and again, you can show that this happens with, with large probability. So uh, some sort of, uh, the probability that this occurs is at least the size of x raised to the two to the something like that. So uh, just to understand that uh, this garbage is totally arbitrary. Yeah, arbitrary. Oh, the garbage, right? No, unbounded garbage, any garbage you no, like. No. But uh, xc should be, the complement should be small relatively to x. No. Uh, no, no. So um, <coughs> all I need is for x needs to be large so that one percent x can be what one percent of the space. That's the same with everything. So the garbage is on small. No, no, no. No, no. The garbage could be x could be one percent and x right and could be ninety nine percent. I just need x to have yeah size at least one percent of h, and that means that the number of cubes that lie inside x will be large, and then everywhere else I don't care. You can do whatever you want. So yeah, but. A 1% polynomial might be nonsense 99% of the time. That's, yes. uh, that's the same. Uh, thank you. Um, okay. uh, so that's so any structure theorem in the state has got to take that into account that the function could be really quite bad. Um, a related example. So this is sort of, I mean, it's sort of a special case of it, really, but um, I could take f of x to be g1 of x when x is in some favorite set y, and g2 of x when x is not in my favorite set y. And let's imagine now that y is a set of size a half or something. But it's a, a random set, so an arbitrary set of size a half. And I'm just going to flip flop between g1 and g2, which are genuine polynomials. Um, so if I were to sort of draw the graph of this function, then uh, I guess, you know, I imagine it as being sort of, I could have two linear functions and then I sort of flip flop between whether I'm taking values on one or the other. Um, and uh, this is, well, this time, if I want um, some derivative of f to be zero, I mean, that's basically going to occur whenever the, uh, the points x, x plus h1, x plus h2, and so forth are either all in y or all not in y. Um, which, say, this example, example five was worse than example six, but somehow example six is different. It's, it has a different flavor. So, um, okay, so that's another thing we have to worry about. Um, <laughs> And uh, just one, one final example, which again is these examples are getting nicer as time goes on. 
Uh, so it's also just true that any function that takes over one values. It's, it's derivative will also take over one values. And again, the probability that it's zero is at least as good as you expect. So those examples are also uh, present. Um, OK, but the theorem is that by combining all of these examples together, that's everything. So the, the main theorem, structure theorem says, uh, if I have a function to, oh, let me say the reals, uh, where x is of h, which is z1 and z to the some small power, maybe, um, and uh, f is a 1% polynomial. Um, degree s and prime of delta. Then, um, so what's the best I can say? Well, having thrown away possibly almost all of the set x, where the values might be garbage, um, I get some set x prime, which is quite large. So, say. It's sort of a positive fraction of h, where the fraction depends on delta. Um, and uh, there also exists a nil polynomial, uh, phi, um, of degree s. Let's make it a bit quantitative. So let's make it a bit quantitative in the 1% thing. Uh, in, in which the one was that? Oh, well, how do, do all these constants depend on the 1%? Oh, okay. Yeah, let me. Or something. Uh, let me say that in a second. So, I'll, I'll write down the qualitative version and then I'll, I'll tell you what the bounds are. Uh, so, um, yeah, so sorry, the, the qualitative statement is that there's also this null polynomial. Okay, and by the way, it has complexity just to make it worse, um, bounded in terms of delta. Uh, where I haven't told you what complexity is, but it's somehow like how complicated is your null manifold? How big is its dimension? How, yeah, when I said a bounded box, how bounded was bounded? These kind of questions. Um, and uh, yeah, and the, the statement is just that they agree. So f restricted to x prime is equal to q restricted to x prime. Um, okay, so that's the theorem. Uh, and so. Uh, you want me to tell you what the? Yeah, I think like this theorem has without qualitative without quantitative bounds can probably de be deduced from the inverse theorem, the qualitative inverse theorem. Right. So yeah. The um, whole point is like the quantitative. Yes, that's a good point. So, um, the the issue is that almost all of the quantitative content is in this notion of complexity, which is going to be an absolute pain to write down before the end of the talk. Um, but uh, I can I can definitely say that so complexity. And the Heisenberg. Yeah, so. Know, uh, um, for, for, okay. Yeah, right, the uh, uh, for, for quadratic. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's a good point. So let's say for us equals two, um, then what this means is that I can take, um, the dimension of the G mod gamma. So it's called one percent eta. Uh, it's called delta at the moment. Ah, um, so what is one percent polynomial parameter delta? I so uh, delta is just the proportion of derivatives which are zero. So it's it's the one so percent. Is, so delta is one. <laughs> it's the one percent. I'm just delta is one over a hundred. Uh, one over a thousand could be it. So well, one percent is is sort of. Um, in inverted commas. That's just my my name for so delta polynomial. Yeah, delta polynomial. Exactly. Yeah. So this is delta polynomial. So <coughs> proxy <coughs> polynomial with parameter delta, if you want. Or, um, I understand. Uh, okay. So all the delta is the interesting parameter. Everything else depends on, on delta. So um, uh, x prime is li linear inside, like it's delta time. You don't lose anything there. Um, oh, sorry. This was sub delta, so I I wasn't being quantitative. Ah. But actually, this part I. This part is pretty good. So, um, so 
So this part, you can get polynomial dependence on delta, which is sort of as good as you can hope for. Um, and uh, I could say more in a, in a precise way, but I think, yeah, I, I throw away the values I have to throw away, but then I don't have to throw away too many more. So that's, that's sort of fine. Um, for the Heisenberg, the dimension here, I think I can take to be also polynomial in delta. Um, and then the remaining complexity things. So, I mean, it, it really comes down to how big this box is um, and possibly some subtleties to do with how you parameterize the Heisenberg, but it, it, it really, you can lump them all in together with like what the metric is and how big the box is. So uh, the, the box size is gonna be, I can only get exponential length. Can I ask a clarification question about complexity? Uh, clearly, it comes from parameters <coughs> sorry, of near manifolds, but I never was able to understand. Maybe you can help with this. You see, when you create generalized polynomials coming from orbits on near manifolds, there, are, there is more than one parameter in play. One is dimension, mm -hmm. and one is the, depth, the near depth. For example, Heisenberg is a two-step, mm -hmm. and uh, it could be deeper step. It could be k-step. Oh, uh, for me, it's always it's always s-step. Yeah. So just these are two parameters which matter, and uh, it is dimension and uh, depth, near depth, which together are responsible for complexity. But how? But s is two. So here. No, in his example, that. maybe he can manage. No, but he always. I think his, his S is related, like the depth is his S. No, yes. But, but because complexity to me at least depends both on dimension and on depth. For me, it doesn't. So, so uh, my, my nil, but yeah, so, so for me, a nil polynomial of degree S, that means that the Nilpotent group G has no potency class most S. So maybe maybe when you write the O there, then O depends on S maybe, right? Like yeah, in yeah. general, it would be O, S, um, this is like for S equals two, but in general, the, all your bounds depend on- So S is the, just to, to fix the S. terminology. S is the nil depth. Yeah. Yes. And dimension doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> well, because you can take Heisenberg in, uh, with three by three matrices and you can yeah, take Heisenberg by n by n matrices. This is the Do dimension. This is his dimension. That's what dimension means. So yeah, yeah. So the dimension tells you how big a Heisenberg you need to take. Okay. And S tells you that. But how do dimension and uh, depth come together to notion of this old subject? No, so so the, the depth is always fixed. So if I'm taking a, a large dimensional uh, Heisenberg, S is fixed. S is fixed. Yeah, so S is like two or something. So for me, I, I'm allowed to take a Heisenberg, a sort of you know. No, but it's a valid question. How you know how how did, how things grow with S? Like how the dependence grows with S, and it grows in your your power of the uh, delta constant. Right. Uh, yeah, so the, the dependence of any of these O of ones on S could be absolutely horrific. I'm, I'm making no, uh, no claims there. Um, but, but yeah, but to prove the U4 inverse theorem, I never have to write down a null manifold that doesn't have step two. Um, so yeah, that's, that, the, the step is fixed for all time. Um, yeah, great. Um, uh, Okay, um, I'll make two very quick remarks and then break for five minutes, if that's okay. Uh, so, yeah, I'm doing here. So, um, the first remark, um, oh, sorry, I, my pre-remark to that remark, this is what I get for S equals two. Uh, it's actually the same and basically is what I get for S equals one. So for S equals one, it'll be a torus and the dimension of the torus will be polynomial and the, the size I need will be exponential. Um, uh, but for S is three and higher, I have to replace these with exponential here and doubly exponential here for some reason. It's, uh, actually, you know, this says the same, but this will be doubly exponential. So there's there's a, an additional loss that happens when you go from two to three, but I'm not really gonna have time to, to get onto that. Um, but uh, but doesn't happen from three to four. No. Uh, three and above is, is, uh, is one. There's a part of the proof that breaks and you have to fix it. And in the course of fixing it, you have to give up an extra exponential. But, uh, okay. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, okay, uh, the other problems I wanted to make, so that the case S equals one, this is actually classical. So we, we know what 1% linear functions look like. This is this is additive combinatorics. Uh, so there's nothing really novel in the case S equals one, but I will talk about the case S equals one 
fair amount after the break because uh, the proof I'm going to give is not the same as the traditional additive combinatorics proof. So the, the special case of my argument with s equals one, uh, the problem is the additive combinatorics argument doesn't generalize to high degree. So you, you have to replace it with something that does generalize and it's, it's instructive to look at what you replace it with that does generalize. Um, okay, and the last, um, oh yeah, so if anyone's particularly uh, uh, looking in fine detail at the statements of the theorems I write down. Um, I'm here classifying 1% polynomials with codomain the reals, and I previously promised you 1% polynomials with codomain a cyclic group, and that's not the same. Um, this is not an accident. Like There are parts of the proof where I really do use the fact I'm working with codomain the reals. Um, but it's sort of, in this case, it doesn't really matter, because if I have a 1% polynomial, let's say from some cyclic group to some cyclic group, um, I can always compose it with the map, well, uh, yeah, I can put the cyclic group inside the unit circle just by taking, you know, uh, x max to x over n, and then I can lift the unit circle to the interval zero one just by sort of adding one more bracket basically on the very very outside and then I have one percent polynomial to uh to zero one you need to also go on the way back right because you say you find a nil polynomial to r but you need to find a, a periodic one though uh yes um oh well no, it'll always be it'll always be periodic no. but I I would have to say that it takes values in in yeah. one over n z rather yeah. than in the reals but you can sort of fix it again. You just round it at the end, right? I mean, sort of having, okay. yeah, yeah. So it, it's no, that's a good point. But, uh, um, yeah, but basically, when I'm working with a cyclic group, the reals tells me everything I need to know up to sort of small extra losses. Uh, but this is one of the reasons why I can't do like FP to the n or something, is because one percent polynomials taking values in FP to the n are really not the same as one percent polynomials taking values in the reals. Those are different beasts. Um, okay, I should definitely pause um, for five minutes and then see what I can say about the proof of this theorem. Obvious where you lose in the next step. Where you said that in the S equals two to three or three to four or whatever, some something yeah, has extra loss. I'm both for my Given where the compact is, maybe not. Um, I can I can definitely explain okay. later where it comes. We, I can talk about where it comes in. Yeah, I mean it, it's. Um, we should be. Yeah, <laughs> we should explain this. There's a. I can hopefully say some things which foreshadow where the problem is, um, but it's. Uh, I can say in words. So, I mean, what? the issue is roughly that you're just very. I mean, if you see something like this, you have to right, whether to define it as a, yeah. a degree one thing or a degree two thing. And if you replace this number two by like 10 to the 10, then it, the choice becomes as obvious, right? Like, is this, it's a linear function that takes 10 to the 10 values. Is that linear or is it, is it basically constant? Yeah. Um, and what the proof gives you is this sort of polynomial hierarchy where sort of I'm trying to understand the derivatives of my original function in terms of lower degree corrections. And, and then I have to understand the derivatives of those lower degree corrections in terms of lower degree corrections and so on. Um, and at the stage that I want to understand the like OZ of one, the bounded into the treble corrections. Um, and things like this are going to be a problem because there can be like multiple ways to describe the same correction that are sort of both correct, but one of them is unhelpful and one is helpful. So you sort of have to go through cleaning stuff up. Like, <clears throat> say, okay, like I decided that this was actually secretly constant. I'm going to scrap this function and just keep one of them. Um, but, but it's this sort of dominoes game, right? So in order to understand that the top derivatives I really care about, this sort of, if this sort of degeneracy exists like further down the degree yeah. hierarchy, um, that causes me trouble in the at the top. So why does it surface only it's really it's depends on only why does it not already surface? Yeah. I don't know. Right. Um so, so in that's the case that's S equals two, I want to understand a quadratic thing, and so 
But the, the lower degree terms are the linear or constant. Um, and cleaning up linear things is you know, straightforward. You can basically do it in one shot. So I can say, given a collection of these linear things, I can just get rid of the ones I don't want and come up with a sort of irreductive set. And then constants are just constants. So you can always clean those up. And then, so you do that in one go. And then, I mean, so you, now you answer the question about your, your one quadratic function you care about. Uh, in a larger degree, basically cleaning up a set of quadratic, the bracket quadratics, seems to be harder because it's sort of like you could clean up the linear ones that live underneath them, but then maybe you'd have to go back and then do another thing and then clean up the linear ones again. And sort of before you know it, the constitution is loaded up and drop. Uh, and basically, the, the argument I have to revert to is just saying, okay, there aren't too many of these functions. Every time I remove one, the total dimension goes down. Like the number of functions decreases, and that's my induction. Okay. The induction of number of functions. Yeah. 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 Right, right. Yeah. One, basically, one is induction on S, and the other is the number of functions. I understand. Yeah, yeah. It's like a little bit like. Oh, it's raining. Before, even before, before. Really? Uh, that's, 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 that's the point. Yeah, <laughs> I also missed the story. Okay. Uh, we continue? Uh, sure. 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 They do need to celebrate. in Austria, it's very So what's the, the plan for the remaining time? All oh, right. So yeah, let's go for the proof of theorem. The, the, the plan is to try and give as much of an outline of the proof as I can of theorem. That's, that's the remaining task. Yeah. So um, there are a number of... Are you going to do it in a S equals one case? Or? Um, Things that don't depend on S, I'll just say in okay. uh, I'll say in general, and, and then I'll try and focus later on the S equal one case. Yeah, so I'll, I'll see what I can do. But, um, and, and so you mentioned once you have theorem made, you can get the inner sphere. Yeah. Um, so I sketched that at the very end of the first talk. I can uh, watch the video. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I didn't sketch it in enough detail, but it gives you that. That's, that's where that's. I don't know. Do you think? Like, get going. Is that possible? Is it? Um, yeah. Why not? Everybody's here now. Okay. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> let's continue. Okay, great. Um, hey, kids. Italian. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. What? Oh, we want to start here. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so let's say the, the remaining task in less than half an hour is to uh, uh, give as much of a sketch as I can of the proof of theorem 8, or at least what the ingredients are. Um, so there's sort of a few stages, and the, the flavor of it all is that you start out with this very weak structure that just you have lots of derivatives that are zero, and I'm going to try and upgrade the structure as I go, where the sort of top structure is a nil polynomial, but there are many stages along the road. So, um, so the very first step I have to do is to say, so what am I going to do about these, these functions where the function is just garbage 99% of the time? So if there's sort of lots of points where your function is just irrelevant, I don't even care about the value of the function at those points. I should just delete them, right? If they're in the domain, they, they should be removed from the domain. Um, so I'm going to call cleaning up. Um, unfortunately, it turns out there's a good way to spot uh, so which values 
is uh, f of x garbage. Um, so you know, I'm imagining some graph where I have a nice linear piece and then here it's just sort of a mess. Um, and the, the easy way to spot them is to say, well, f itself has many derivatives that are zero, um, but x should be a good point if there are many derivatives starting at x, which is zero, right? Like many derivatives involving the point x. So a typical point in the garbage, there won't be many derivatives at that point that vanish at all because the function is, is garbage there. So um, I'm gonna say x is sort of good um, if there are many derivatives uh, delta, oops. involving x, which is which are, are zero. I mean, it would be the same if x appeared somewhere else in this, in this derivative, but uh, yeah, so specifically, let's say at least, you know, delta prime times h to the s plus one values of, of, of h, which are give a zero derivative. Um, okay, so the strategy should just be take all the bad points and, and delete them, right? But, uh, so yeah, just to delete all the bad points in the sense. So if a point is not involved in many interesting derivatives, then just, just remove it. Um, and that's pretty good, but there's a bit of a subtlety, which is, so unfortunately, if I take a point which is sort of on the threshold of being bad, um, and I, uh, I throw it away, I remove it from x, there might have been some derivatives that had that as a, as a point mentioned in the derivative. And those derivatives are no longer in play, right? Because the function isn't defined anymore. I've, I've removed the point x. So you have a bit of a sort of chasing your own tail game whereby removing some points will tip other points over into becoming bad points that were previously good points. Um, and it, it, you need to deal with this somehow, right? That, that sort of, uh, fortunately, this is a solvable problem. It's like taking a graph and trying to find a subgraph with large minimum degree or something, right? You delete all the low degree points and then that causes other points to have low degree. But eventually the process terminates and at the end of it, you still have some edges left. So uh, you, you succeeded. Um, so, uh, so at the end of the day, you're, you, you, you're left with a, a set of size, say, delta, original delta of some power. Um, yeah, exactly. Which, um, this happens for every eight, for, uh, for many eights. Yes, exactly. So at the end, uh, we want the all, all x in all x prime, uh, maybe x1 or something. Uh, uh, o of, oh, sorry, delta to the O of 1 divided by O of 1. Yeah, but uh, uh, in, in the sense that they have many derivatives starting at x, which, which f takes the value of 0 and are defined. Um, so I don't know how much I want to say about this. Um, this is sort of even then not quite what you want, it, it becomes amazingly useful. There's a technical innovation, which I'll describe very briefly, which sort of helps with this, but also helps massively everywhere, um, which is a sort of huge generalization of this. So um, for example, suppose we're working in the case S equals one. So, you know, I have uh, what I call a, a cube. So a point X, X plus H1, H2, and uh, X plus H1 plus H2, let's say. Um, and you know, we start out by saying, well, does this little parallel pipette have derivative zero under f or not? And if it is, it's a good parallel pipette. And if it's not, it's a bad parallel pipette. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I could call a point a good point if it's contained in many good parallel pipettes. Um, but maybe I also care about whether uh, an edge is a good edge, right? So is this xx plus h1 contained in many good parallel pipettes or not? And again, if it's not, it's really not a good one to keep around. So I should get rid of those. So I have this sort of multi sort of inductive process going on where I need to delete bad points and bad edges and bad parallel pipettes and still see if I have anything good left at the end. Um, so, uh, and I mean, the, the benefit of doing this is that once you've done it once, you never really have to do it ever again. So, um, Uh, so maybe I'll just define this in, in S equals one uh, and then leave the rest of your imagination. But so uh, I call this a system of cubes um, uh, of degree one. 
uh, consists of subsets. Uh, so S zero. Degree one is a is a parallel pipette or an edge? Oh, sorry. So a, a two cube is a parallel pipette. So the, so and a cube of degree one is a two cube or? A... Um. So the, a system of cubes of degree one goes down as far as um, parallel pipettes of a pool two cubes, which is. The same as just, yeah, second derivatives. So uh, this notation is C1 and C2 of H, that means what I call C0 is points, C1 is edges, and C2 is parallel pipettes, and, and so on. So it's 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 isomorphic to these are the places on which you evaluate derivatives, basically, right? So you can think of them as just H cross H and you know, X comma H, or you can think of them as X, X plus H, the pair of points. Sort of matter of taste. Um, so yeah, so I have a, a set of good points and a set of good edges and a set of good parallel pipettes. Um, and the the deal is that. So what do I need to know? So uh, so condition one is a sort of symmetry condition. So if I take a good parallel pipette and just exchange H1 and H2, that should still be good, right? That's sort of the same derivative, basically, just reparameterized. So symmetry, um, in the interest of time, I won't write these down uh, explicitly, but yeah, so you can set a parallel pipette like this. You can also mirror it like this. So uh, again, if I think of this as a derivative starting at X plus H1 with derivative like negative H1, that's basically the same thing. So uh, I shouldn't think of those as different points. So. So just say symmetry under coordinate permutations, reflections. Uh, and then two is a sort of going down. Um, so that which says that so if I have a if I have a good two cube, good parallel piped. I want all of its one-dimensional faces to be good one cubes, to be good edges. So if uh, if C is in S2 is good two cube, uh, then all of its faces are in S1, in other words, they're good, good edges. And a good edge is, is it participates in many good um, uh, pipettes. Uh, so at the moment I haven't said what a, a good one. This is a standalone definition, but uh, but that will be encoded in part three. So uh, yeah, so so one condition is, is going down. So if I have a good two cube, then all its faces are in S one, and all its vertices are the points. So on, um, and the third part is going up, and this says, well, what we say is if I have a good edge, it should be contained in at least delta prime good cubes. And if I have a good vertex, it should be contained in at least delta prime good edges. Um, so you can always sort of go up by one. Uh, and, and there are many ways to extend by one. So up any C in S1 is contained in at least delta H, prime H. So uh, I think my question is S0, S1, and S2 are. Are consists consist of good S two is the set of two of good two cubes. Um, or he, yes, but in a slightly more general way than I originally defined good a good vertex. No, so no, this is a but more, in this way, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so because you said uh, yes, yeah, so so good okay. means in S two and in S one. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, My question is unrelated. Uh, S equal one on the first line there. S equal one and degree one. Uh, yes. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, and so on. So, um, you can see some things, uh, Right away. So, for example, any for any good vertex, any vertex in S zero, well, it's contained in at least delta h good edges, and each of those good edges is contained in at least delta h good cubes. So, 
this guy is contained in at least delta squared good cubes. So it definitely generalizes our original notion of good, but it's sort of, it, it's, uh, it's a technical difference, but it, it makes a huge difference in practice uh, to sort of find and then keep in play a, a system of cubes. This is like a dependent random choice argument or? Uh, it's really, it's very combinatorial. So, I mean, the, I haven't said what the argument is, but the proposition is uh, you can find one. Can you phrase this entirely in terms of hypergraphs, or do you need the arithmetic structure? Um, you need quite a bit of sort of uniformity. Well, uh, the proposition about a state, it's, yeah, it's probably some, there's probably some hypergraph argument. Um, th there's a related result that says that if you take a system of cubes and start nibbling away a few of them, you do like delete a few cubes at each level, then you can repair it without sacrificing too much. And that's, that's a bit more delicate. That sort of depends on this. It's very, very uniform hypergraph, right? There are sort of exactly this number of ways of extending it. Right, right, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, so you can find one with like S2 contained in the set of points where uh, F has zero derivative. Uh, with with delta prime quite large. So massive tidying up exercise that, that uh, once we've done it, we, we can relax. Um, but just to give a very quick indication of why this might be useful. Um, so for example, um, if, uh, so the function d1 of f, you can think of as a function, this is from, you know, of x and h, so this is a function on uh, on one cubes, right? Um, take a single derivative of f, that's a function on pairs, on edges. Um, then uh, delta one of f restricted to good cubes, um, it turns out takes uh, takes all of one values. Which is sort of useful to know. So um, you like your derivatives to be uh, sorry for uh, sort of messing this up, really. Um, uh, so, sorry, the fixed H, uh, the function X max to delta one F H on S one takes all the one values. So this is meant to be good, right? So if I take a single derivative of a function, that's meant to be kind of constant-ish because the, the degree goes down by one. So it used to be roughly linear, <laughs> roughly constant. And, and that's sort of genuinely true that it takes over one values on these good edges. Um, and the argument is just, well, for any good edge, there are at least delta ways to extend it to a good cube. The derivative here and the derivative here must be equal because the, the total, the second derivative is zero on this thing. So the derivative here is equal to the derivative here. And, for many choices. So sort of every choice of every value of delta one F on good edges is popular and you can't have too many popular values. So you only have uh, one values. So sorry, that was very hand wavy, but this is the sort of good thing that happens when you recursively care about not just good points, but also good edges. Right. But in this step, you actually don't lose, right? This is, this is- Very combinatorial, this polynomial. This, uh, thing is all, everything is polynomial. Everything's great. Yeah, this is, this is as good as you could possibly hope for, yeah. Okay, um, that's all I'll say about cleaning up. Um, so we've now thrown away all the bad points. The only points left are points where. This yeah. also works for any of you. Like, right? This is not a Z mod NZ thing. This yeah, it's a very general statement. Huge generality, yeah. Um, any, any S, any, any group, it's all, yeah. all it's great. Um, but still, you stay fine, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, otherwise. Maybe if you have probability, anyway, who knows? Um, uh, okay, so the next stage, so this deals with the functions that were sort of garbage 99% of the time and, and good stuff 1% of the time. I now have to worry about the functions that were flip-flopping between two good functions, right? Two genuine functions, because these have no bad points essentially, right? Like a, the, every point is valuable. It, there are many gonna be many good derivatives by just focusing on your own side. Uh, so I haven't deleted any points so far, but I do really have to split up the world into its sort of good pieces, right? So given um, 
I'm going to write over example five or six or something. It was six. Uh, so this was, you know, uh, you want an X. Um, why say? Um, I need to uh, split up. Because uh, remember, I don't know what Y is. I, you know, if I, all you tell me is the function, I need to somehow detect which points belong to this set and which points belong to this set. Um, because this function by itself won't be an autonomy, so I, I really do have to break it apart. Um, okay, so we now have to think, okay, so a good, a good vertex is one that has many derivatives. When are two vertices in the same part? When, when do they deserve to sort of look like they sort of have many joint derivatives, right? Like have many, have many derivatives that mention both of them. That turns out to be exactly what you want. So if, uh, if X and Y have many derivatives, uh, derivatives, uh, which are equal to zero mentioning both, then they're probably in the same part. It's a sort of intuitive statement that, uh, yeah, at least when you look at an example, if two vertices are in different parts, then they're unlikely to be, it's sort of very lucky if you find a derivative that has both of those points in it. So, um, detect the parts by looking at, uh, when the pair x, y is contained in many derivatives. Um, and as it happens, given what we just said, uh, there's a sort of nice way to phrase that, which is just to say that like x, y, or if you prefer x, you know, y minus x, the, 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 the two vertices are x and y, and the, so it's in other words, x differentiated with parameter y minus x uh, is, is in s1, it's a good edge. So we have a notion of good edges, and if an edge is good, then that means that the two endpoints are probably in the same part. Um, so that's great. Um, so we'd imagine that if we look at S1 as a graph, right? I mean, S1 you can think of it's a set of edges, so it's a sort of graph. I mean, we imagine that S1 should just sort of split the world into a union of cliques, somehow, right? And in each of these cliques should be uh, one of the, the distinct functions that makes up this function overall. Um, Unfortunately, there's, I mean, maybe it's true that S1 is basically a union of cliques, but I have no idea how to prove that. That seems to be difficult. Um, this is a sort of combinatorial problem. Um, so roughly speaking, if you're following the classical proof of the U3 inverse theorem, this is the point where I would say something about Balogh Samrady Gowers. So this is like having a set with large energy that has pieces that don't talk to each other. You want to find one good piece. That's what I'm trying to do here, but I'm trying to do it in a way that generalizes to larger degree. Um, and uh, okay, so the trick turns out to be, well, a trick turns out to be, I don't really need every pair of edges X, Y to be good. I just need a sort of graph that's pretty darn connected. Um, so I can get away with, so if there's sort of only one nice function, if there's only one sort of polynomial going on in this whole picture, it would be great if every pair had many derivatives in common, but it's okay if the, there's a sort of highly connected graph of pairs that have many good pairs in common. Um, um, so the way I will formalize this is by saying highly connected, I'll say, as being like large cheaper constant. That is. Um, so if S1 is highly connected, there's just one piece. Otherwise, I'm going to go and divide the world into pieces so that each piece has, is highly connected. And you can sort of do this iteratively by sort of just chopping up your graph. So you, you start with a graph. If you find a sort of almost disconnection of it, like a, a good cut, then you cut across that, that disconnection. And then uh, look at what's left. And if there's a good disconnection, you cut across that as well. And eventually, you'll end up with, with a bounded number of pieces. Um, this, you do, in, do you lose in this step? Um, in the statement itself, not so far. In reality, probably yes. So 
uh, in your formal statement, you get a, a bounded number of pieces, and how does this bounded number of pieces depend on delta? Um, that, that depends is good. Uh, yeah, so the, the quantitative statement itself is very good. The question is really, if you have large chiga constant, but like chiga constant delta or something, uh, is that good enough like to use? How do you use that fact? And that's the bit that's inefficient. So um, in Balog Semerady Gauss, you really do find this sort of cliquey thing, and that's very, very strong. And because here I'm only using the fact that it has large Chiga constant, it might be that you have to walk like delta oh, one of the delta steps to get from one part of your graph to another part of your it's graph. I will later, yeah. Um, uh, when, when I actually at the point in the proof where I actually use this, I'll lose exponentially, yeah. And it's sort of I'm not smart enough to do Balog Semerady Gauss, so that's this is an inefficient step. Um, uh, so is, can you state this statement formally, like a formal statement with the constants for this? Um, I could try. So it's something like, so given a parameter uh, beta, um, I can find uh, uh, another system of cubes. Um, S prime I uh, with parameter something like delta minus O of uh, um, eta to the minus one over O one, something like this, um, such that um, each connected component. Of uh, S prime one has G constant at least. Um, so I'm going to go around chopping up the graph. Every time I chop up the graph, I lose some edges. And by implication, I lose some cubes and I lose some vertices and things, but not too many. So I, uh, this is a sort of small, this is a large subset of the original cubes I had. But so remind me what is the parameter of. Uh... Of uh, this system of cubes is this uh, delta prime? Delta prime, so I should have said delta prime. Uh, and that depends polynomial on delta, the original. If you start with a delta polynomial, then delta prime is like polynomial on delta. And then you say Chinger constant is some ratio between boundary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's sort of can you cut the graph in almost cut the graph into two pieces with a few edges crossing the boundary? Uh, and the dichotomy is just if you can, then do it and uh, iterate, and then when you stop, then you're happy. Um, yeah, okay, um, how am I doing? So, okay, so this sort of, I shouldn't have spent as long as I did on this, this section of the proof, but it's a sort of, it's an important step. So I've now sort of divided the world into non-interacting pieces, and on each piece, I now have a, a single function a restriction of f, which I care about, and which I want to, uh, uh, Want to extend to, to classify. So um, let's just say without loss of generality, there is now uh, a single component like x or s or something. So I'm going to look at each component by itself and just analyze that restricted stack. Can you say again how you define a component? Did you define it in any place? So S1, a... S1 is a set of good edges. So that was what came out of my sort of iterative popularity argument. But essentially, I mean, it started out as just being, do you, are there many derivatives that mention you both? But um, it, yeah, it got more complicated, but it's, it's morally that. That defines a graph structure on, on pairs of points, right? So here's a point and here's a point. Then having an edge between the two is saying that there are many parallel pipettes along that edge. Um, and if that's true, I've got an edge, and if not, then I don't put an edge, and, and that gives me a graph structure. And I now want to sort of um, find robustly connected pieces of this graph. Okay. Um, it's sort of a weird thing to do, but it... Okay. Um, okay, um, cool. So, uh, yeah, so maybe I've done that, and now just have a single piece. Um, so I still have this issue that even if I started out with a function defined on the whole space, I now have a function defined just on some small piece of space. Um, so, but a nil polynomial is defined everywhere. So, so maybe the next step will be to somehow extend uh, f uh, 
uh, to a function on H. Uh, in a sort of nice way. So this is sort of probably the most uh, this, this distinctive part of the argument. So um, here's the, the idea. So if, if this is my, my group H, and I start off with some set H on which, uh, X on which my function is defined. Um, I'm going to extend it to a function on the whole of H by randomly translating the original function. So I start out with X, I then translate it. Here's like X plus A1. Over here is X plus A2. On each of these, I just define the same function, but translate it. So say XI is going to be equal to X plus AI for some random, uniform random AIs. And FI is going to be the function on x i that sends x plus a i to, to f of x. It's just a, a translated copy of the original function. And then if I do this enough times, I eventually sort of cover all of h, right? So uh, um, I've now, I have at least one function defined at every point of h, almost every point of h. Happy to lose 1% of points. Um, but the problem is that where they overlap, these functions don't necessarily agree, right? If uh, maybe I'll call this x plus a3 or something. Like that. So I'd like to just glue these functions together, but there's a problem because they don't agree where they're, they're meant to be glued. Um, but this is not as big as a problem as it looks. So what is the difference between, uh, let's say, fi of, if I have some point, let's call it y, which is in two of these sets. So it's both equal to x1 plus ai, and it's also equal to x, x plus a i, and also equal to x prime plus a j. So it's in two translates. Then f i of y is, you know, f of x plus a i, and uh, f j of y is f of x plus a j. Um, and so f i minus f j evaluated of y, the difference between the two is this difference. And because AI and AJ are fixed, um, so I can write this as the derivative in direction uh, AJ minus AI of F evaluated it. So if you think of AI and AJ as being just like some fixed random numbers that I'll choose once for all time, there are boundedly many of them, um, then this is a fixed derivative of F. And fixed derivatives of f have a lower degree. Yes. You, in your first line, you had x and x prime, and then the x. Oh, I beg your pardon. Um, uh, sorry, yes, I've messed this up somehow. Um, the AIs and AJs also go away. Um, let me see. So, uh, sorry? Mm. On the previous board. Right here? Yeah. This is, I think, correct. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So this is f of x minus f of x prime. Uh, thank you. Uh, which is um, x prime is equal to uh, rearranging this. That's x plus ai minus aj. So actually, this is f of x minus f of x plus this. So my nonsense. Sorry, this is the derivative in direction ai minus aj of f evaluated x. Uh, I think that's correct. Um, so okay, so the, this, the difference, the like the, the co-boundary or something between this function and this function where they agree is something of degree one lower. So in our case, for s equals one, this is basically a constant function. Um, or at least like if a i minus a j is a good edge, then it takes over one values. So, um, so yeah, so I can't just naively glue these together, but the obstruction to gluing them together is something I understand incredibly well, namely just a bunch of constant functions. Um, so yeah, I can, if I then just, just do it and define a function 
let's call it F prime, on like the union of the xi's by, you know, uh, F prime of x is equal to F i of x to the smaller side of what? Um, glue them together, you know, two of them are both defined, choose the smallest one, it doesn't really matter. Uh, then, yeah, then it doesn't really matter which one I pick because they all differ up to, to small constants that I, that I really understand very well. Um, so, okay, so I've succeeded in extending my function to a function on basically the whole space. This is roughly equal to h. Um, and with a little bit more work, so, I now want to understand the derivatives of uh, f prime. Um, the derivatives of the original f are all zero along good cubes, but um, sort of by a similar translating argument, I can sort of take any derivative of f prime and sort of translate it until it looks like a good derivative of f. And the differences I pick up along the way will just be basically constant functions. So I end up deducing that. This takes O of one distinct values. So um, yeah, so that's the success of the section is that I started with a function that just had zero derivative quite often, but by translating it arbitrarily and gluing it together, I end up with a function that takes O of one distinct values and is defined on almost all of H. Um, just say almost all. There could be a small handful of points where it doesn't take the same value. It takes a zero to something else, but that's instead of one percent of the world, so that's okay. Um, and as we've said a couple of times, like it's not too hard in the spirit of the proof I gave last time to show that these things are bracket linear. Um, so that's a sketch I could give, but I'm over the time. Um, so. Shall I say? It's not so lucky in the next step, right? Because you're not going to get d3 something or d2 of like in the next step, you'd have something linear for, for these these differences would be kind of yes approximately linear things. And yeah, so exactly. So maybe that's a good place to finish. Because it's kind of a pretty theorem like the like this or one value theorem. Yes. So what happens when s equals two in the next level? I'll say this and I'll stop. So um, the same argument is going to basically work. So uh, I find that when two functions f i are defined at the same place, their difference is going to be something of degree one lower. So in other words, it's going to be like a 1% a linear function. Uh, so f i minus f j is 1% linear. Um, and so when I try and analyze d3, Well, the same kind of argument is going to show me that you know I can sort of shift and translate around until I relate it to a derivative of the original f. Um, but the corrections I pick up are going to be of a form. Well, they'll be like you know some constant um, times. Well, let's just say O one of z times you know some bracket linear function g one evaluated at x, and then maybe a similar thing for g1 evaluated at x plus 1, and so on, where the g1 and g2 up to some like bounded number of g's, these are bracket linear. So, um, so this is a Structure. So if you keep doing this, you could then analyze the bracket linear things and say, well, I understand their derivatives. Their derivatives are sort of take over one distinct values. So you end up with a sort of hierarchy, right? To understand the derivatives of f, I can do that in terms of functions of degree one lower, and I can understand the derivatives of those in terms of constant functions. Um, so I call this a polynomial hierarchy. Um, and it's much less straightforward to show that those are nil polynomials, but that can be done. And the crucial thing is to analyze what these, so these, these should not only be bounded numbers, they should also come from some sort of co-cycle, right? They should sort of come from saying, I'm gonna take a derivative of the fractional part function and sort of it's not quite zero, but it, it behaves like a, um, yeah, it, it is some sort of co-cycle defined on some 
some growth. And if I can really understand that these are co-cycles, then I understand sort of everything. I, I understand the derivatives of f in terms of purely algebraic pieces. If I, if I can say this is algebraic and these are sort of algebraic, then I sort of morally done it, done all the work, and then there's a ton of algebra involving nil manifolds to show that that actually means the original thing is a, a nil polynomial. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm way out of time, so I should just stop. <laughs> Question yeah. before this part, mm -hmm. which you're not going to explain, but um, to get this uh, connected, Bowers has this ran dependent random choice argument that gives you something that has a small, without almost any loss, that has almost surely all the derivatives Spanish, right? Uh, yes. Would that set that he um, produces be the same as your S? Um, or is it possible to show that? Or is it obviously not that? Or That's a good question. So there's a technical problem. <laughs> you can just about see it here in this. Uh, it's because before this part. I no, I, I understand. Right? But, so, but because I need to apply this recursively, I need to understand G at basically all its values, not just on a large subset of values. So, but if, say, say you had like a fixing that. The, the, yeah. Yeah. I'm saying, so but say, say you knew that um, you need to know uh, uh, 100% to know for all points. Yeah, I, I do. Well, like almost all points. So that, that's why I can't just copy Gauss's dependent random choice argument. Um, is, is because I, I can't. You, but if I did. The miraculous reason uh, uh, way were able to fix it so that it would have had, or you had like 100% Gauss argument, right. that would so, uh, give you their S1? Um, so, so basically, the way I think of the dependent random choice argument is that it, it's telling you something about this graph S1. So that the graph S1, dependent random choice, tells you. I can find a piece which is sort of basically a cleave or something or like yeah. that, um, very, very strongly connected. Um, but uh, but that's sort of, it's sort of using some structure as far as like, well, it's, it's, not like, it's very easy argument. It's okay. It is. Um, in the way I've set it up, I'm, I'm not sure it's true. I, I think you're worried about the case that your graph looks like an expander or something. Um, so this is the sort of the enemy case, right? Is that S1, how do you know that S1 isn't some sort of random graph, like a, a sort of large? Um, it just seems that morally it should give you a connected component of the- like Right. The, uh, so I think I'm saying there's a gulf between what I think should be true and what I can actually prove. And I can prove very little about it. And I sort of, uh, and I, there's stuff in work of Matt's cats and things where they're talking about what seem to be quite similar issues where it's sort of, We've never seen any of these objects, but it's hard to rule them out where this, this S has an exotic structure and it, it sort of, um, it's like, how do you know that doesn't happen? But I, I, the way that I've done it here is to say, I don't know that it doesn't happen, so let's play along. Um, and the dependent random choice gives you some piece of information that, that shows that it doesn't happen. Um, and I don't know how to merge the two. But uh, yeah, if you could tell me something interesting about the structure of the graph S1, that would be very useful. Um, but you could potentially start with this uh, set of Gowers, and then I mean, that doesn't simplify your argument because that automatically gives you like a ninety-nine percent thing without any loss. Um, so well, there are two arguments of Gowers, and I'm not sure which one you mean. I mean the one that tells you that you have, or maybe everybody else can go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Why don't we need a true constant for S two? Ah, oh, first two. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I didn't tell you where the Chica constant came in, but um, that's because I slipped it onto the, yeah. comes in in this place. So I said that this derivative is basically constant, but I don't actually know that. I only know it's constant if there's a good edge, uh, if, if this derivative is sort of a good, one of the good values. So if it's bad, then I don't know what to say. Um, and the Chica constant comes in by saying, well, okay, but I don't just have two functions intersecting at this point, probably. I probably have many functions intersecting at this point. And then I sort of form the graph between them. And as long as there's a sort of path of good, good AI minus AJs that's taking from one, one representative to another representative, then that's good enough. And this graph turns out to be a sort of random sample of S1 and random sample of a graph with Kachika constant is, um, is uh, um, almost surely connected. So uh, that, that's, that's where that comes in. I don't need it for higher things sort of, yeah. Basically, the reason you need it for, for S1 is because otherwise the induction doesn't even get off the ground. Um, that bad, bad non-connectedness properties of S2 or whatever 
are really annoying, but they're not so annoying that I can't even start the argument, whereas grass one is terminal. So that's, I think that's my answer, like, yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks.